Right, thanks. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so I'm Fiona Robinson, um, not Richardson. Um, and thank you so much this morning for joining us, John. Uh, so author of Iconicon and Outskirts and Concretopia, as John says, they're out in uh, the foyer for signing later on. Um, but today we're talking about Iconicon. Um, just starting, really, how, how did this one, how did this book come about? What was the inspiration for it? Well, um, so my, the first book I did, Concretopia, was sort of the story of the post-war rebuilding of Britain. And I guess I come from Croydon, which was a town that got massively rebuilt in that period. And then that sort of book ends with the building of Milton Keynes. You know, it sort of ends in sort of the late 70s and the sort of beginning of Milton Keynes. And, um, and at that point, when I finished that book, I thought, well, I've sort of done that now. I don't know whether I'm interested in the sort of story after that. And I couldn't really see what the story after that was. And I think there's that weird thing is, you know, when you grow up in the middle of something, you don't really, you don't appreciate it. And you don't understand, you don't really necessarily understand what's going on. And you maybe haven't even noticed what's going on, really. And then I sort of, and I guess the world, you know, the world happened. You know, I wrote Concrete Opera in sort of 20, you know, it came out in 2013. But the following, you know, the following decade, been insane. So, you know, all these things have happened, you know, some of them really terrible things, some of them amazing. And, um, and I guess it suddenly gave me a bit of perspective on that period, really. And so I suddenly thought, actually, there is a book. I could sort of suddenly see that there was a book that told a, st a completely different sort of story from Concrete Opera, but of this sort of period since 1980 and the things that have been built since then. And I, and I guess, you know, there were sort of some tragic things that happened, like, you know, Grenfell and then, you know, the, the lockdowns. I mean, I wrote sort of, you know, sort of finishing the book in the first lockdown. And, and that actually sort of scuppered quite a lot of the trips I was going to do, you know, for the book. So there were places I was supposed to go that I couldn't go, you know. So, sorry, Morecambe, you didn't make it into the book, so I couldn't go. Um, but, um, but yeah, so I sort of suddenly felt, you know, with these kind of, these things felt like there was a bit of a full stop to this story and I could sort of understand, it sort of gave me a bit of perspective on everything else, really. Um, but, yeah, when I, I guess when I started out researching it, I didn't really... I didn't know necessarily what I was going to find because, as I say, it's sort of like you live through this stuff and you don't see it really, and then <laughs> you force yourself to look at this stuff and go, "Oh well, but what is it?" And then, you know, it's quite a surprise. So, is the next book back to Morecambe? Exactly, <laughs> next book entirely about Morecambe. <laughs> it's called The Guilt Trip. Um, <laughs> it's, no, no, no. But um, I might, I might do something about Morecambe at some point because it is quite, it's sort of interesting story because they're, they're supposed to be getting um, a second Eden project. It's supposed to be happening in, in Morecambe, um, and then they've also had quite a lot of um, interesting sort of social housing built. Uh, there where they sort of cleared quite a lot of streets and built this sort of built this new stuff and then reclaimed quite a lot of the old buildings and then also there were all sort of weird, weird things that did happen there in this period like there was Blobby Land one of one of three Mr Blobby themed uh, theme parks that didn't open for very long funnily enough weirdly <laughs> the appeal for Mr Blobby didn't last as long as maybe the investors thought so yeah the weird ghosts of Morecambe I think Mr Blobby is big again on YouTube and with the sort of <laughs> younger, so maybe maybe there is a, you know, bring back Blobby Land, who knows. And <laughs> um, one of the themes that really runs through the book is about people. It's the people behind these buildings and these places, the people that live there or have worked there or, or built them or designed them. How do you find these people? And they have just brilliant stories and just really care about these places. Where do, where do you meet these people? Yeah, I mean, finding people to interview, because, yeah, as you say, you know, all the books are sort of the stories of people, because I'm sort of trying to tell the story of the places through the people that made them happen or live there and experience them or whatever. So um, finding the people is not always that easy. Um, sometimes, and weirdly, like, the more famous somebody is, the easier it is to interview. Like, it's very easy, you know, like, I interviewed Michael Heseltine and... Um, you know, a few kind of quite famous architects for this one. And they're really easy to interview because you just contact somebody and they've got a PA, 
you know. They, they've so organised. They've got somebody that organises their whole life and they just go, oh, yeah, we'll put you in next Wednesday at two. And you're like, oh, brilliant. Whereas most of us, we don't have a PA. That isn't how life works. And actually getting hold of people, and even finding out whether people have got an interesting story, it's not obvious, really. Um, so it's mainly begging. I mean, it's mainly me trawling through all the people that I know and all of their connections and then on social media and then through connections, through things like this. Quite often at events, I will be kind of a bit like, and I'm doing this thing and I can't find anyone who's lived in a prefab. And then somebody will take pity and come up to me and go, I lived in a prefab. And they go, thank you. Um, so so the finding people is a really random process. And, you know, frustratingly, it will be that thing where, you know, I'll spend like four years researching a book and writing a book, and then the book will come out. And then um, and I'll spend all this time saying, I, I just need somebody to tell me about living in Stevenage. Why would anybody tell me about living in Stevenage in the 60s, you know? And then, um, and then the book will come out, and then immediately about four people I know will go, oh, my nan lived in Stevenage, she designed the church. And, um, and I'll be absolutely furious for months. <laughs> well, that's how the research process normally works. <laughs> well, I did see something on your social media where you were looking for people for, for your next book, but we'll perhaps come back to that. In yeah, more Peggy. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And another theme, I think Docklands features really quite a lot in your, in your book. You sort of keep returning to it at different points. And we had a wander around Docklands um, on Thursday, actually. Oh. We, um, yeah, so it was, it was quite a nice little trip little extra bit of research before today. So, um, why Docklands in, as a particular focus? Well, Docklands is really interesting uh, because, you know, in the period sort of 1980s sort of onwards, you know, it's a, you know, at the beginning of 1980, you know, a lot of Docklands was sort of derelict and that plan for kind of regenerating it and completely changing it and even calling it Docklands was, you know, still kind of on the drawing board, you know, and that, that you know, there had been various ideas about how to regenerate Docklands and that uh, but nothing really had happened in any concerted way and then it was Heseltine with his you know turning it into a development corporation and sort of sort of like a scaled down version of you know what happened here you know like a really small sort of a much more um, sort of privately funded version of that as well, which is sort of interesting. So it was a sort of change in emphasis from, you know, the new town to that sort of thing. And so so there's that. I mean, one of the weird things about walking around Docklands is you see, like, there's so much of the, particularly that 80s Docklands, that is nicked from Milton Keynes. I mean, you just see it everywhere, you know, the street lights, the furniture, you know, the way, the way that the buildings relate to one another, the design, you know, there's so much of it. You kind of like wander around these sort of mega kind of like noughties, great big glossy, huge high rise things. And then you walk around the corner and then there's suddenly a bit of Milton Keynes there. And you're like, oh, hello. Um, so it does wear its, it wears its kind of history on its sleeve as well, which is quite handy. So, you know, you can see you know, you can see you can see the kind of evidence of all of the, all of the different phases, and also it's quite interesting because you know it, it builds up quite slowly. So, 1985, um, uh, I'm sure we all remember the video for "Dancing in the Street." Uh, Mick Jagger and David Bowie uh, dancing around various warehouses, high kicking <laughs> through various derelict buildings. Well, that was Canary Wharf um, before Canary Wharf. So then they get knocked out. All those warehouses not. not David Bowie and Mick Jagger, they don't get knocked down. But the, <laughs> the warehouses all get knocked down and then suddenly we've got, you know, this mega development happens on that site. And I sort of find all that stuff really interesting that we've got, you know, that, that you know, in my lifetime, I have very strong memories of a, of a thing that then gets completely obliterated and replaced with something else that I then also have very strong memories of. And that is sort of quite a powerful thing, I think, you know, that, the, you know, we can have these, these sort of attachments to places or memories of places um, and they can sort of get erased and replaced by something else that you also then have very kind of strong memories of and also where I grew up New Addington which is sort of ha housing estate which is quite high on a hill outside Croydon we had a view right over to Docklands and we could see Canary Wharf getting built you know sort of like if you just stood on the football field you could see you know you could, you could see all these high rises going up and it felt so weird and it did 
it felt like some kind of weird sort of alien invasion had happened <laughs> very slowly. Well, there's a line as well, my favourite line, I think, in the book. It says about um, redevelopment doesn't always have to scrub away all traces of lives lived, lives vividly lived. And I think that's probably in part about, well, it was about Heaven Nightclub in, in the book, but yeah, the, the lives that would have happened in that bit of Docklands before Docklands as we know it today comes, comes out of the ground. Yeah, and that's, you know, you walk round, you know, walk round about Docklands and, you know, you might think it all got entirely rebuilt. But in fact, you know, quite often you've got all those new things that are built on the waterfront. And then immediately behind that, you've got all the council estates and places that, that are still there. And you just have these, these weird pockets of completely different sorts of lives going on next to one another with people that don't relate to one another and have got no, you know, don't do the same things and aren't and aren't kind of connected by any kind of common thread really, other than they occasionally use the same street, but they don't, but there's no, no kind of like integration of these different groups of people. There's a, there's a brilliant novel called The City in the City by um, China Myville, which is about a sort of sci-fi sort of Blade runner -y type novel. And it is, um, and it's about these two cities that essentially exist in exactly the same geographical location and the people in the two different cities have to sort of learn to unsee the buildings and the people and the cars from the other city because it's a different it's a different place you just you just you know it's like completely verboten that you would that you would that you would see these places and walking around somewhere like Docklands it really reminded me of that book you know I could really see where he'd sort of where that idea had come from because it is you know, it's very clear there that you've got people that are just sort of completely unseeing this other life and these other people and this whole other community that are living right there. It's fascinating. And what I also like about the book, lots of things, obviously, um, but it's about places that we all know and recognise. So Docklands is an example, but um, the Millennium Dome, for example, we can all imagine these things. There are other buildings within the book or places, and I think, oh, I'm going to have to Google this. And so you do sort of need a companion guide alongside. I know that we've talked about that you can't have that many pictures in your book, but yeah, yeah you sort of need this companion website where it's got some nice pictures of all of these things. Um, but the, the bit about Barrett's homes and those different sort of uh, house builders coming through in the 80s, and Laurie Barrett, I particularly enjoyed um, the section about him, but it's again those sorts of places that we can all, we all know these sorts of environments and we can imagine ourselves in the Barrett's home or whatever, but um, yeah, that was a, another highlight for me, I think, of the book, and you're going to read a little bit about that. Yeah, section, yeah I was going to read a little bit from the, from the Barrett section. I mean, it was so nice, actually, you know, I interviewed loads of different people that grew up in sort of different developer houses in different places, including one guy who, when they moved into their house, uh, their ideal homes uh, house, uh, it, uh, they realised that, that actually the, the show home was slightly smaller than sort of life size, that they couldn't actually get beds or furniture into the rooms in the way that it looked like they could when they were at the show home because everything in the show home was seven eighths correct size and um so they you know and it was just horrific to have that and then you know um i interviewed david Locke, who you know one of the planners of you know who worked on a lot of milton Keynes, and he was saying you know that there were sort of stories of summer doctrines where that had happened as well you know the whole sort of estates where that went on so yeah so weird so all sorts of good stories about that but anyway this is a bit um this is a bit about laurie barrett and barrett holmes probably the most famous of all these developers laurie barrett had a helipad installed in the grounds of his home enabling him to visit two building sites a day to check up on progress and generally shit everyone up. <laughs> Actor Patrick Allen stood in for him in a series of television commercials, jumping down from a white helicopter to make thunderously feel-good statements about the ease and simplicity of it all. At one point, they had a promotional parachute troupe. A photograph shows a team of five, including a couple of men with magnum P.I. tashes and a woman in an avocado boiler suit. As their marketing got more pervasive, there was a branded bus. You could even buy a corgi toy of it and sponsored racing cars. 
Barrett's speciality became a type of house designed to tempt the first time buyer onto the property ladder, the starter home. When Barrett came on the scene with their marketing techniques, Wimpy just said, that's a complete waste of money, said David Penton, director of Barrett's old rival. I'm always amazed at the way Laurie Barrett has persuaded the rest of us that we are in the marketing business rather than a building business, said Tom Barron, founder of another, Wellmar Homes. He alone convinced the industry that it had to be market orientated. Barrett sold the idea that a new home could be cheap, exciting, easy and fun, and not an enormous burden but a fashion accessory for an aspirational lifestyle. Uh, then there were people like Moira and Trevor interviewed for Signs of the Times, a BBC series on taste from 1992, which I think is still on iPlayer, so do look it up, uh, who bought a show house and kept all of the furniture and fittings and spent their entire time marvelling at the good taste, at their good taste in China busts, a Mozart, of Mozart and dried flowers that they'd inherited. <laughs> I love it. I used to live in a Barrett's house in Luton, I should confess. And, but you see exactly the same house in Morecambe or Murfield in Leeds or, you know, all of these other places. Um, and it's, yeah, just that sort of repetition that, um, I mean, People need to live in homes, don't they? But maybe a bit more imagination needed. And I think, you know, when I was sort of writing about those places, I mean, initially, the sort of, you know, the impulse is to do the thing that I guess we sort of see a million times, which is just be super sneery and very kind of, you know, you know, whatever. And immediately, you know, as you start to talk to people and, you know, go around these places, you just realise, you know, these are people's lives and, you know, people's homes and they live in them and it's you know a there's much more interesting things to say about them than just being really sort of sneery but um but also you know it's really like incredibly like, unkind and unhelpful just to kind of you know write something just slagging off these places and i sort of feel like that is the you know that's the kind of mode with which these places are talked about so i've sort of tried to be a bit kinder than that are you gonna buy a barrett's home next is that your yeah, yeah, exactly. aspiration yes. yeah <laughs> um and thinking about Milton Keynes, I suppose that through the Development Corporation, the 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 way that the plots were broken up to lots of different house builders, and there were so many more house builders than there were today. You know, they're, they're all owned by two or three big companies, aren't they? I know that you've been part of the Newtown Heritage Register panel. I managed to get you roped into that. Um, I should say I. I'd stalked John for a decade, maybe, since your talk about Concretopia at the gallery in Milton Keynes. Um, and then my partner is the conservation manager at the council, and, I'd, and he was starting to do the Newtown Heritage Register. And I said, you need to get John Grindrod for the panel. He'd be brilliant. Um, knows about Milton Keynes, but knows about other places. Would have a really um, good eye for, for what might want to go onto the panel and have, have some really good input. So. Um, I did manage to get you roped into that, which was, um, you know, we're all really pleased to have you as part of that. But you've obviously been on some really nice trips around Milton Keynes and seeing some places that um, even people that have lived there all their lives probably don't know that they exist across the city. Have you had any particular highlights anywhere that you've really enjoyed seeing? I mean, what, I mean, what is so cool about doing this thing is that basically Simon has been sort of driving us around, you know, and going, oh look, here's a, uh, you know, and the next thing on our itinerary is this with an enormous spreadsheet. You get out of the car and then, you know, you sort of walk around the corner and there's this incredible thing there that you just wouldn't know. So it's been like a brilliant sort of like express trip into sort of the, the sort of slightly wilder side of Milton Keynes, which has which been brilliant. Um, I think my favourite thing that I've seen um, is the sports pavilion in Woofton, which is, Amazing, and I don't know how many of you know know it, but it's this sort of big pagoda. Um, it's a really like fascinating building. It's really unusual. I mean, it it doesn't it doesn't look in any way like a sports pavilion. Um, it's really um, it's got like enormous amount of personality. It is it's very kind of Chinese, um, and uh, you know it's for sort of cricket and, and um, rugby, I think, and um, in it. 
uh, <laughs> and I guess the interesting thing about it is that, you know, if this building had been built like, sort of 100 years ago, you would accept that it is really quite an eccentric building and that, you know, there's a kind of, you know, that things have changed and that, you know, that, you know, the way that we all live has changed and maybe the sports have changed and whatever. But actually, this was only built, you know, like about 30, 35 years ago, you know, not, not that long ago. Um, none of those sports have really changed. And um, the, and the interesting thing is that already, it just seems like a crazy relic of a sort of, you know, of, of a sort of different way of thinking about the world. And I think that's sort of brilliant that, that Milton Keynes allowed um, really imaginative, unusual uh, thinking that wasn't, that wasn't sort of all about just sort of basic functionality and nothing else. There's a lot of stuff in Milton Keynes that is really extravagantly strange and, and full of personality. And you don't, you know, a lot of towns don't have that, particularly with kind of new buildings, don't have a lot of new buildings with a huge amount of personality. And Milton Keynes, you know, is a place that got built sort of, you know, so, so much stuff got built so quickly. Um, it could easily have just been very generic. And one of the things I love about Milton Keynes is that, you know, when I sort of first started to sort of drive, go around, you know, my partner, we were sort of driving around with my partner, given that my partner has lived his entire life in and around Milton Keynes. Um, you know, we were kind of going to different estates because I'd be like, I want to go into Coffee Hall. And we'd be like, all right. So we'd go into Coffee Hall. And then we'd be like, what? What's going on in Coffee Hall? I didn't know it was like this. Because you don't, because if you, you drive around the grid roads, you don't realise, do you, that everywhere's different from everywhere else. And um, there is a kind of, you know, it's sort of quite fun that, the, you know, the, the grid roads give you this sort of fake, sort of slightly false idea of a unity of Milton Keynes, that you, Milton Keynes is this very kind of um, unified thing by this grid. Um, but actually, within that grid, Everything is really quite eccentric. You know, we do lose that, you know, probably in the last 20 years. You know, I would say that, you know, since the winding up of the Development Corporation, you know, you can see a definite kind of, you know, a loss of, of that kind of personality. You know, you don't get so many sort of pagoda sports pavilions built in the last 20 years as you did before. You know, you can really see that, you know, in those kind of, you know, you know sort of, you know, home world, energy world, future world type expos, which are so brilliant. Um, you know, that we we kind of, you know, you get, you know, Oxley Park, you know, there are there are kind of like a few sort of modern things that, that are doing that, but but not to the concentrated extent of that earlier period. And I do find that fascinating. Yes, yeah, so I'm find I'm finding loads of it really interesting. Excellent. Good. I'm glad that I uh, managed to get you roped yeah, in and it wasn't thank even you. regretting it. Thank you for school. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a bit in your book about the Leeds look as well, um, which I quite enjoyed. We were keeping our eyes peeled when we were in Leeds a couple of months ago, and just is that Leeds look? Is that Leeds look? Do you think there's a bit of a Milton Keynes look? That, oh yeah, yeah. But perhaps it's... more positive than the yeah. Than the well, the, the so the Leeds look was you know I, is is a sort of version of postmodern architecture that Leeds went crazy for in the sort of late 80s, early 90s. And they um, essentially, it's sort of like very red bricks. They decided, right, we were a red brick town. So they went sort of really, really this fantasia on red brick, but, but like a quite a boring fantasia on red brick. Um, and so, yeah, it, it's very old. I think I describe it as a sort of Mount Rushmore of John Majors. Um, <laughs> it's got that kind of vibe. Um, Milton Keynes hasn't really got, I mean, there is a, I guess the different phases of Milton Keynes have got different looks, haven't they? You know, those sort of, uh, you know, the sort of early 70s stuff has all got a real kind of hangover to that sort of heroic post-war modernism. You know, the, the 80s stuff is sort of taking a lot of that sort of developer sort of POMO stuff that's becoming a bit kind of, you know, fashionable, but doing it, doing it in a really like unusual way. And with, you know, you can, re you can really see, you know, a lot of quite eccentric things happening in, the, in a lot of the 80s stuff, which I think is very interesting. And then maybe sort of in the more recent period, you know, things are sort of feel very conventional. Makes me a bit cross about that, um, that jam song, um, 
about Milton Keynes, which is very sneery, um, you know, and sort of sees it as this kind of, you know, Thatcherite utopia. And I think, you know, you know, shut up, woking boy. That's what I thought when I listened to that song. <laughs> Excellent. Um, there's also sort of a bit of a theme about buildings as branding of, of different places. Um, and a, it's a bit of a controversial view about the, the well, there's a lot of discussion about the points in particular in, in Central Milton Keynes at the moment, isn't there? But inadvertently, whether we want it or not, the point becomes a bit of a, a branding, a bit of a, an icon for Milton Keynes. Um, and I really loved how it pops up in things like the Red Bull home run posters for, for when they were driving their Formula One cars around Central Milton Keynes in December, and you know, the, the points on those posters. And some people might not want it there, but, but it is there, it's an icon. Um, I'm just thinking what, what makes something iconic and a bit of a landmark. And obviously your, your book is full of those sorts of things, but are there some key things that, yeah. that might just pop out? To, yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, I absolutely love the point. And one of the great things about the point, and the thing that's really obvious about the point, is that it's so beloved of people. You know, it's full of people's memories. People are attached to it as a place that they went to, and they're attached to it as a landmark. And as much as people trying to build an iconic building would love to have people feel that about their buildings, you can't make people feel that way about a building. That, something extra has to happen people you know it's about our connection to those buildings you can't make you know the gherkin is sort of another fantastic example of that you know the um it's an absolutely wonderful building there was you know you sort of see the sort of absolute kind of hysteria in the the sort of London, the city of London, about having a tall building at that point. You know, they're, they're still very kind of scarred from uh, NatWest Tower, which was built in the late 70s, you know, that, you know, and, and they, they're sort of, they've been determined not to build anything that high. And then Docklands has happened, and then they panicked about that. And they said, oh, we need to, we need to do something. What do we do? And they, they, you know, Norman Foster is going to build this enormous tower that's going to be there. And then luckily, that enormous tower gets kind of clobbered um, and that developer pulls out and then another developer um, or oh, no, another company basically decide Swiss Re decided they want to have their headquarters done on that same thing and then they hire Norman Foster again to design a completely different building on the same place but it's only going to be half as high and it's this and it's this kind of very interesting kind of faceted kind of curved thing and it's all about sustainability as a sort of main the main kind of sort of calling card of that building um, and so there's all this kind of like stuff going on in the background, not very promising, um, but it gets built and immediately everybody loves that building. It, you know, we, you know, we see that building, it's got, you know, it has a kind of emotional response, makes people happy in a way that, you know, a lot, you know, most high rise buildings, they don't, they don't do that, you know, and the thing, a poor old Norman Foster, you know, I mean, the thing he got really, I mean, poor old Norman Foster, what am I talking about? <laughs> <laughs> I wish. Um, I mean, he was so upset by the fact people were calling it the gherkin. And there was a whole thing about, you know, calling it, you know, journalists were trying to make the phrase erotic gherkin happen at the time. <laughs> Luckily, that didn't happen. But, um, you know, it was called 30 St Mary Axe, but nobody calls it 30 St Mary Axe. Even the people that work there don't call it that. Um, and he was so cross about it, you know. And you can see with the shard, when the shard went up, I mean, I used to commute through London Bridge Station every day. And what they did with the shard, which was slightly after, was they wrote the words, the shard, on the concrete core as it went up. And then every time they started to build a bit more of it, they moved it up. And it got smaller and smaller. And they kind of chopping bits off the sign until you could barely read it. Um, and, um, and that was in an effort so that nobody gave it a silly name. Because they were desperate, at this point, you know, people were so desperate to kind of brand these things, you know, and make them this kind of corporate, sort of posh corporate statement, you know. And the last thing they wanted was somebody giving it a sort of fish and chip shop name, you know. They just didn't want that, you know. But weirdly, the fish and chip shop name is one of the reasons we like the gherkin, you know. And so iconic buildings, you know, I sort of, you know, I think Barrett Homes are iconic. You know, they're not iconic you know, in a way that the Gherkin is an icon of London, but they are an icon of a particular moment in British history and a particular moment in sort of British 
aspiration and fashion. So they're an icon of something else. They're not an, uh, they're not an architectural icon, but they're an icon of sort of culture, which I sort of think is quite interesting. So some of the buildings in it are, you know, you know, the Millennium Dome, you know, it's very much an icon of the Millennium and of London. But, you know, some, but a lot of the buildings in it aren't, aren't iconic in that way, but they, they're a symbol of a particular thing, like business parks and that sort of thing. You know, I sort of think, you know, I, I got absolutely obsessed with business parks doing this book. <laughs> and you admit to it as well. I mean, that's the... <laughs> yeah. Yes, I'm John Grindrad and I'm obsessed with business parks. <laughs> I'm, I'm in a safe space, I can say that. <laughs> it's not being videoed. Oh, it is. Oh, it is, yeah. <laughs> yeah it is. It's fine, no one know. Oh, no. <laughs> Excellent. Right, well, I was going to open it up to, um, to our audience and see if anyone here has some questions for you. Everyone rushes for the door. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, I haven't been to Morgan, no. That's such a good question. And also, horrible, what a horrible question. Um, that's really hard to answer. Um, the biggest mistake of an iconic building. Well, I'm not a massive fan of Ian Simpson, who's designed, you know, sort of Manchester based architecture, designed quite a lot of um, sort of big towers in various cities around Britain. And it's sort of inevitably. You know, if you look at the tallest tower in Birmingham and Manchester and Liverpool, they're all designed by him. You know, it's sort of, and I sort of feel like they've all slightly failed icons. You know, there's something about those buildings that that they they make a statement, but they you there's nothing about them that that feels quite of the place enough. It doesn't. I don't know. You know, it doesn't. You look at, I mean, they're sort of almost all called Beetham Tower because they were all sort of for this developer called Beetham. And, um, uh, but you could kind of swap them. Like you could move them and people might not notice for a couple of weeks. <laughs> um, so that feels like a mistake. <laughs> Oh, good old Poundbury. Um, I mean, Poundbury is extraordinary. I don't know how many of you have been to Poundbury. Um, so it's Prince Charles's, sorry, the King. I, I, I haven't got used to that yet. Um, uh, his sort of model village, um, town, whatever you want to call it. But actually what it is, is it's a, it's a suburb of Dorchester. So you basically walk through like a big sort of post-war council estate on the edge of Dorchester and then suddenly you're in Poundbury so it's sort of like right right next to it sort of you know on the same street is the beginnings of Poundbury and it sort of sits right on the edge of Dorchester just as a, a little suburb and it's not it's not kind of it's not massive in a way that you know any of the new towns and particularly Milton Keynes you know I mean you you know come, you know if you come from Milton Keynes and you go to Poundbury, you're like, what, is this it? I mean, <laughs> it's only it's tiny. What are you talking about? It's two grid squares. You know, it's really small compared to, compared to kind of most of the sort of post-war things and, and most of the sort of bigger developments I've written about. And, and it is weird because it is this kind of historical fantasia, you know, it's a, it's a riffing on a load of kind of historical precedents from Britain and around the world. And so, and it's supposed to, it starts off, they've got this idea that it's going to be Dorset vernacular is the thing that they're going to, you know. But immediately they get carried away, you know, nobody wants to say no to anyone, you know, that it goes crazy. So you go into the middle of it, bear in mind how small it is. It's got Queen Mother Square, which is the centre of Poundbury, which is, which is like St. Petersburg. It's ridiculous. It's enormous. 
I mean, what, who on earth would build like a little tiny suburb and then build this enormous, enormous sort of neoclassical and kind of, you know, like mixture actually of different, of not even a sort of coherent, but sort of a mixture of different sorts of um, historic architecture styles, all, but all on a sort of massive scale, just o overpowering everything. Um, so yeah, it, I, it's a bizarre place. I mean, you know, when you're going around, you know, a lot of it is lovely. You know, a lot of it you go around, you know, really cute little kind of, you know, pretend cottages and stuff going on. There's, um, you know, when I was there, you know, they were building a lot of sort of industrial revolution warehouses, that kind of thing. You know, it's quite strange. I mean, it's a very odd place. Um, but uh, yeah, but and actually the other thing about it is they didn't really, because there's a real pushback against everything that sort of Milton Keynes has tried to do, which is integrate cars into the planning of everything and sort of make that whole thing work. They sort of have deliberately not done that in Poundbury. So as a result, you can't actually see a lot of the buildings because they're hidden behind enormous four by fours. Um, and, you know, or you, you get these cute little squares, which are meant to be like a little French market square, but they're just full of cars and you can't, you couldn't, you, you know, there'd be absolutely nowhere to sell your, to sell your posh jam. Um, so it's, yeah, it's a weird, weird place. And I sort of admired some of it. And then, but overall, I sort of felt like it was, it was in such denial about what it had done that it, I, I, I you know, it, that ultimately I sort of feel like it's slightly failed it, in the, it hasn't, it hasn't achieved, I think it hasn't achieved, it hasn't done what it thinks it's done. I think that's the problem. Well, the king obviously um, visited Milton Keynes a couple yeah. of weeks ago. Sorry um, about that. <laughs> not, um, not a big fan of Milton Keynes. Maybe he just needs to spend a bit more time here. We yeah. need to take him on a little tour. We we'll get Simon on his uh, on his minibus, taking him around some uh, the new town estates. Excellent. Yeah. Can I then just ask possibly your opinion about the Latour Hotel at the end of town? Oh yeah. So amazing view. If you go up to the top and you go in the bar and, you know, you have a cup of tea, which is what I did, very nice. Um, I mean, it is weird when you're driving around, you know, it is slightly taller than the tallest tree, I've noticed. I mean, that's one thing that has occurred to me. I don't know whether that anyone else has noticed. It does appear to be a little bit taller. Um, it is, I mean, it's so disruptive, isn't it? And actually that kind of creep higher you know, the snow dome, Sainsbury's, you know, the, the kind of like little kind of things, da, 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 we're just going to get slightly higher than the trees, but we're not going to, and then suddenly, da, da, reach for the sky is happening. Um, it is a bit of a shock. And also it was built so quickly, wasn't it? It was sort of almost there overnight. I don't quite know how they managed to build it so quickly. Um, uh, it, I mean, architecturally, I mean, you know, it's, it's like barely there, is it? I mean, you know, it's just like a, it's a shape, it's a skin on a thing. That's it really, isn't it? There's not really anything to say about it as a building, but as a, you know, as a sort of viewpoint, it's amazing. And it sort of is, and one, the lovely thing is you get up there and it's like those Helmut Jacobi images of Milton Keynes, you know, the helicopter flying over, you know, those really early kind of drawings. You sort of, you're like, I mean, the drawing, it's amazing, you know, so if you can kind of like divorce yourself from it like that, it's actually really cool. And it is really cool being up there, but it is so counter to all of Milton Keynes, you know, all the ideas of Milton Keynes. It, you know, it, I don't know, it just, to, to, have, to have that building there, it feels like it just happened quite lightly, like there wasn't, there wasn't really any sort of discussion about about breaking all of the rules of Milton Keynes for something so such a massive building, it just you know oh, oh we've done it here it is ta da um, so yeah I, I find that peculiar that 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 happened sort of without anyone noticing it feel, also it feels slightly like one of those kind of lockdown things doesn't it like you know I, I remember actually going back to Leeds the the people in Leeds were sort of saying that the 
so much stuff got built in the centre of Leeds during lockdown. Like an enormous amount of stuff got rebuilt and, and things got, you know, they rerouted later the traffic and stuff. So loads of people hadn't been in the centre of Leeds for like a year and a half. And then they went back into Leeds. And they were all like, where, where did Leeds go? We can't even find it. We can't even drive around it. We don't know where we're going. It kind of changed a lot of the routes or the walking, you know. So it's sort of, there was a peculiar thing, I think, when I started, you know, sort of when I was trying to finish this book during lockdown, um, I'd imagine that it was a full stop, you know, that it was going to be a pause. And actually, in a lot of places, it was like, quick, no one's looking, do everything. <laughs> so, yeah, there's a peculiar thing that happened there. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Question on urbanism. Mm -hmm. What other contemporary urbanists do you look up to? So I, so my background is I don't have any, I'm, I'm just a geek. I don't have any training in architecture or planning or anything. And I sort of came to this as a, as a person that, that just wanted to try and explain, um, I'd read quite a lot of those sort of post-war history books like Austerity Britain and, and that sort of thing. And they were all really, really sniffy about architecture and modern architecture and stuff. And I thought, well, there's probably like a more interesting story there. But I don't know what it is because I don't know anything about it. So I sort of went to sort of try and research some stuff and it sort of turned into a book. And so I sort of feel like I, sort of, I have sort of stumbled into this sort of field slightly by accident almost, you know, just through just being interested in it. Um, and... I mean, there are so many, there are so many writers that I do really admire. The, I guess, you know, it's sort of interesting. I, there's a great book called Villages of Vision by Gillian Darley, which is sort of all about, you know, the sort of history of um, sort of planned settlements, you know, which I guess could have culminated in places like Milton Keynes. But... Um, but you know, you know, Saltaire and sort of all sorts of different um, sort of settlements like that, and you know that that kind of that writing where somebody is situating kind of urban thought in a sort of historical way, and sort of that sort of for me a sort of storytelling narrative that she does there, I find I personally find very appealing as a as a way of kind of approaching stuff because I guess I'm not approaching things from a kind of philosophical sort of abstract perspective and I'm not an academic so I don't have that background and also I'm not a planner or an architect so I don't come from that angle either I'm very much a kind of you know you know a civilian a sort of you know a user so so for me somebody kind of with a more kind of narrative approach I find I find really very helpful to try and understand the what I'm looking at and why why I'm looking at this stuff. So, um, yeah, I mean there there are there are loads of writers I, I that I really admire. You know, I really I love I mean Hathaway's stuff. You know, there is sort of there's a lot of there's a lot of people that that are writing in this field that whose work I really enjoy. I mean, I do you know John Bowden's Municipal Dreams. I think was again another book that was very helpful in terms of you know situating you know what was quite a nebulous story in about council housing and municipal housing and municipal building um, in a sort of concentrated way rather than it just being a sort of element of a story that sort of gets slightly ignored so for me those 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 writers are probably more the more the sort of writers that I'm drawn to, if that makes sense. Um, cool. Great, thank you. Any other questions? Oh yeah, down at the front here. Thank you. Oh, just up here. Oh, oh, sorry. Oh. Well, we're, we're, we're <laughs> looking at two different people. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, well done. Tick <laughs> straight to the head of the class. Um, yeah, so, the, so there are lots of. I mean, 
it's clearly a stupid title and people keep calling it. I loved Icon Icon. It's not Icon Icon. Um, so I, you know, made a slight rob from my own back by making up a silly word. Um, but yeah, so I, I called it Iconicon partly because I thought it was like a lexicon of icons, you know, and then also I felt slightly like there was a kind of con with the iconic building where um, there's a sort of sleight of hand that goes on with, you know, uh, we distract you with this very kind of glossy, expensive, you know, project. But meanwhile, we won't actually build any of the houses or infrastructure that you actually need to live in this place. So, you know, and a lot of the, a lot of the really big architectural practices uh, when I was writing Concretopia, that sort of that, pe that post-war period, all those big architects, all those big practices, they all did loads of social housing, they all did loads of, you know, council housing, they all worked for local authorities and then sort of became private. Thing. And in this period, that isn't the case. All of these big architectural practices, they will talk about this stuff, they will talk about council housing or whatever and how important it is, but they don't bloody design any, do they? They don't go and do any. You know, you get very few of the sort of big names actually do stuff. You know, Richard Rogers actually was one of the few that sort of did, but even within, you know, his practice, it's still a really tiny part of what they do. It's not, you know, it's not the sort of majority. So I sort of feel, felt like there was a bit of a kind of, um, you know, sort of thing being pulled over a rise. Is it wool? I can't remember. That phrase is, eludes me. But yes, but, the, um, you know, that the, there's a sort of trick going on. And so, yeah, I was aware of that. Yeah, so it's a slightly, it's a slightly naff pun, but I couldn't, couldn't help myself. Yeah, and that's sort of, it's sort of interesting that, isn't it? And again, again, you know, like sort of what I was saying at the beginning, you know, that there are, you know, we live through periods where, you know, we remember the place before it was changed, then it gets changed into something else, and then that then gets changed into something else. And you have that sort of weird, I guess it's just the thing about getting older is that I've noticed that, that I'm living through kind of various eras of places and seeing them change before me. And you suddenly realise at some point that you've got a bit of agency and that you can try and do something, you know, if you can, you know. Um, of course, the, the trouble is, most of us don't have any flipping agency in this stuff, do we? We don't have, you know, if we, if we did, you know, the world might be quite a different place, you know, if we were, you know, and, you, you, you know, some of the loveliest things that I sort of ended up sort of finding out in Iconicon were the were the places where people had been really, really involved in the decisions, you know. So Granby uh, in Liverpool, where the residents actually sort of, they made a massive difference to the place that they lived in, which was basically these, these four streets that were falling down, these sort of Victorian four streets that were barely inhabited, most of them boarded up. The few sort of women that lived there, and it was mainly women at that point, um, decided that they, they were sick of it, set up their own street market, cleared it all up themselves, painted all the shutters that were over all the windows, made it look a lot more appealing, gradually got more help, gradually ended up, you know, getting architects and people on board, made into a community land trust. Um, and then they won, weirdly, they won the Turner Prize. They didn't even win the Sterling Prize, which is the architect's prize. They won the, they won the Turner Prize for art for that, which is amazing. And, um, and it's like the loveliest place. If you go around it, it's these four absolutely gorgeous streets now. And it's in Toxteth. So it's in the bit where, you know, it was where all the, you know, riots and stuff happened, right in that kind of epicentre of that. Completely like ruined place because no no investment for years and just seeing the people that live there actually make those changes and you know and be in charge of those decisions and it's so rare that that ever happens you know mostly we have no we have no control over the things that happen to the places around us and it's actually really inspiring to find a story when you know that actually has happened and it's worked and been so successful and you'd think oh well everyone will copy that but of course hardly anyone has which is a shame so it would be nice if there was more of that Right, I think we've got one more question. Thank you. Thank you. 
is the really a counter-previous topic, actually. Oh. It doesn't apply to Milton Keynes. Okay. It does apply to London. Does it make you angry that quite a lot of very, very expensive and coming intended to be iconic buildings are never used because no. they're simply uh, bought as overseas investment opportunities? I'll give you, obviously, posh parts of London. It makes me very angry. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you look at all of that mega development that's gone around Battery Power Station. You know, that is a sort of classic example of that. You know, we, I mean, even before that happened, you could have pointed at like 20 different places in London where a really concentrated amount of that stuff had been going on. But that seems like a sort of, it's almost like a sort of crazy sort of Monty Python satire of that thing that had been going on anyway. It's like an extreme absurd sort of version of that. It's like Terry Gilliam has designed the whole place. It doesn't make any sense that, that we already knew that was a massive problem and a terrible thing to be going on and you just wouldn't do that to a place. And then let's do it even more. Let's do more of it in a more extravagant way and get all of the most famous architects, you know, from around the world and get them all to do that all at once. You know, it's a sort of a slightly absurd thing. So, um, yeah, I, I, I do, it does make me very angry, you know, and actually the thing you really notice is if you, is if you go around at night, so few of the lights are on, you know, that's the thing that is really galling, you know, with places. And sometimes you, you might think, oh, nobody lives there, you know, no, you know, they're just an investment, they're not actually for people. But you'll go there and actually there are, you know, there are, you know, there are people there at night and you think, oh, I was, I was wrong about that, but actually, Something like that, it isn't the case. And so many of those places are empty, you know, and I think, I think that's really sad. The thing that makes me really hopeful, I guess, is that, you know, I do some work with student, architectural students, and they, there's a real sense of kind of hope and optimism among young people sort of entering kind of architecture now who, um, you know, want to sort of change things for the better and have got a real sort of social conscience behind what they're doing and I sort of that makes me feel really hopeful I guess the thing that needs to happen is the same thing needs to happen to developers Some, somebody needs to make developers more you know more engaged with this stuff because it's, it's not the architects who make these things happen it's the developers it's with the money you know so if the money isn't coming from a source that will allow that to happen then you know if it's not you know a sort of that sort of social entrepreneurship needs to be the thing that drives more developments rather than a sort of corporate, you know, top-down, abstract, you know, funded thing. You know, it, need to, it needs to come f more embedded from the place and then you end up with places that are sort of, you know, that feel more appropriate for where they're being built and actually built for the people that live there or want to live there and not, and not just to some, you know, like it's Bitcoin. Like, you know, like we're going to build a place that doesn't exist. You know, there's just some abstract thing. Well, it isn't an abstract thing. That's a big chunk of somebody's city now. You know, that's really, that's a real shame. Wow, thank you. <laughs> we're getting a ten and a half. <laughs> um, so just finally, yesterday, did I see that you had been nominated for a Architecture Book Award, was it? Were yeah, that was the world chop. Congratulations, <laughs> very good. Very much. Nice. Um, and what happens next? What are you what are you working on now? Uh, I have got two different books that I'm working on. One is a sort of another sort of big architectural kind of history thing, only over a longer period, and sort of trying to tell. I guess that the the when you get books about architecture that try and tell sort of the story of. British history through architecture, it tends to be castles and palaces and you know cathedrals and stuff. So I thought, well, I would do I would do kind of more ordinary buildings and kind of discount all of those buildings. So I'm sort of trying to tell sort of a sort of historical account of the last 250 years of Britain through sort of more everyday buildings. Um, and then I'm doing another one which is about, which is going to, it's a shorter book, which is going to happen before that, which is about suburbia. And it's about, particularly about sort of uh, LGBTQ people in suburbia in the 20th century, sort of before the internet, um, and experience of living in suburbia when it's sort of, you know, that story sort of feels like it's been a bit ignored because everyone always writes about the city, you know, running away to the city and stuff. So I'm, 
I'm not running away to the city. You know, as somebody that's basically lived in suburbia pretty much all their life, you know, I thought it would be quite interesting to write about the experience of suburbia in the 20th century from a particular point of view. So, so it's that. So more interviews, more, more begging. Yeah, so if anyone <laughs> wants to volunteer to be part of uh, John's next book, now's the opportunity. Fab, thank you so much. Um, so I've got a few thank yous, but yeah, that brings us to the end of our session, um, but not the end of the uh, Lit Festival. So there's a few tickets left for the remaining events uh, and hope to see you back here later today for those. Um, I must to remind you to please fill out some of the feedback forms to help with the next Lit Fest. Um, they're being waved at me from, from the sides, <laughs> there we are, um, and pop a comment on our post-it board as well. So John's now going to be signing his books in the foyer, if you would like to um, have a little chat with him there. Um, so before you head off to the rest of the festival, um, please do swing by and see John. But I'd also like to say a big thank you to our generous hosts at Milton Keynes Central Library. Thank you very much. Um, oh, nice. Uh, our festival booksellers, uh, Waterstones, the AV team from CARC and our lovely volunteers. Thank you. Uh, the videography team at the Open University, so I think this will at some point be on YouTube, so I'll be able to show my family. That's uh, my big moment. <laughs> um, our lovely sponsors, Milton Keynes City Council, and the wonderful John Grindrod. Thank you very much. Oh, thank, you. thank you all for coming.